Well, welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Heidi Gardner. I am delighted to be here talking to you today about smarter collaboration. And we've got the link for you here to take a super quick anonymous survey. We're going to be using these results. It is a mini, mini version of the Smart Collaboration Accelerator, a psychometric tool that we've developed to help embed and implement the principles of smarter collaboration at both an individual and especially at a group level, like practice groups and sector groups and leadership teams and management boards and so forth. And so we'll be talking about this later today. We wanted to give you a taster of what it's like to experience the accelerator, and we'll be sharing your results as we go forward. So please, we invite you to use the chat function and the Q&A function. One of my colleagues from Garden and Co., which is our research and advisory business we run outside of Harvard. Um, Chilla Ilke is our insights director, and she's joining me on today's session. There's Chilla, and uh, Chilla's going to be keeping a close eye on the chat, because if there's one thing we know from neuroscience, it's that multitasking is a fiction. So while I'm talking through all of our content together, um, I'm going to be counting on Chilla and the rest of our amazing Harvard Law School team here to keep us honest and let us know when questions come in either through the Q&A or through the chat. So welcome again, Smarter Collaboration. It's been out for a whopping one month and five days, but who's counting? Um, and we have had the opportunity already to uh, engage with audiences around the world, law firms, other professional service firms, and more and more with organizations, companies like the ones that are your clients. And it's been absolutely thrilling on this journey to bring those smarter collaboration ideas um, to the fore. And we will be talking about today how you can think about engaging in smarter collaboration, not just internally, but also with the broader legal ecosystem and with your clients. And so um, stay tuned. We're going to be moving fast today. A teeny tiny bit of what we are talking about is uh, going to be a review for many, many of you who are uh, long-time devotees of the smart collaboration idea, but quickly we're going to be moving into what's new and different about Smarter. So you'll probably remember that we talk about smart and smarter collaboration as the business imperative that is arising from the clash of these two trends. On the one hand, you have all kinds of specialists, people who are not only IP lawyers, but IP lawyers for a certain class of IP, for a certain sector, for a certain jurisdiction. And this is the imperative. This is necessary in order for anyone not just to be seen as an expert, to, but to be an expert. These days, of course, law firms and the broader world you're operating in are full of different kinds of experts, be they operations experts, pricing experts, um, human capital experts, training and development experts, and thinking about how we engage these different disciplines and these different perspectives in order to tackle the volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous challenges. I'm here on the Harvard campus right now, which is why I've got this blank canvas behind me in one of the conference rooms here. And we are working um, today, yesterday, and tomorrow with a major professional services firm, thinking through how they bring partners together in order to tackle not just clients' VUCA problems, but the broader societal and business issues that we are all facing. I mean, we can't get through the headlines these days without talk of impending doom. Well, you know, someone's misfortune is somebody else's good fortune. And the question for you is, how are you joining together different perspectives on things like um, economic uncertainty, political uncertainty, um, talent market uncertainty, potentially um, continued inflation, uncertainty about what the Fed is going to be doing, a whole host of regulatory changes. How do you bring different people together who know these realms and use it to look into the future? How is your firm going to cope with some of these challenges? And very importantly, how are you equipping your clients to do that? Anyone who claims to be able to handle these kinds of things, ah, I'm an expert in this. I've seen this movie before. Let me go handle it. Highly, highly suspicious. We need people who are experts to integrate their specialized knowledge to tackle these kinds of complex challenges. And many of you have started crunching your own data here. 
What does it look like when you are teaming up across practice groups to serve clients? The twist that we now have brought to bear when we're working with organizations, law firms in particular, is trying to understand not just where barriers are, but where are the bright spots and how much money are you leaving on the table? So here is data, live data that we've crunched uh, from an organization very, very recently. And here's what we know. So across the bottom, one, two, three, four, five is the number of practice groups serving a client in any given year. The left axis has the average fees per client. This happens to be in euros. Now, of course, the magic here is in the steepness of this climb. Any client that is getting served by five plus practice groups is significantly more valuable in fee terms to the law firm than any of the others. And it's not just five times one. Right? So here we have um, significant upside revenue. And the question is, you know, how do you think about which clients are being served with the full force of the firm and what value are they getting? Our strong assumption here, of course, is that you have incredibly demanding, clever clients. They're not paying for value that they don't receive. So if you are um, collecting fees from them for this cross-practice group service, what is it that they value? Is it the, the seamless service? Is it the fact that you're addressing more complex issues for them? Is it that you've got brand permission because you have five different practice groups serving them and it gives a halo of legitimacy and credibility? They know that when they turn to your firm, you're able to address it in the most cost-effective and deepest, most customized way possible. All right, so this is what we learn from crunching the data on fees. Now, nearly every firm we work with has the classic long tail problem. You'll see over on the left-hand side that there are 2,000 plus clients that are served by just a single practice group. Those, as we know, are quite vulnerable clients. They're much more likely to get picked off by a competitor who can bundle them with more higher value services or value add services around it they're also more likely to get squeezed on the fee structure. And so this is something that we have to be um, hyper aware of. The thought experiment for all of you is what would it look like if you were able to shift this curve? So here's what it looks like if you take 10% of the number of clients that are served by, you know, in any given bucket and move them one step to the right. So look at it previously, the blue number showed that you had 384 clients that are served by three practice groups. Take 38 of them and figure out, not in a crass, cross-selling, inhospitable way, but in a client-centric way, if you've already got three different practice groups that the client really values, it signals that they trust your firm to do more than commodity services. How do you use the people who are already in there serving those clients to generate insights that the client is going to value? Ask yourself, what do we know collectively that that GC would, would be so welcoming and value? What's your hypothesis about what you know that the client doesn't know? Remember, they're trapped in their silos. They tend, with the exception of a few industry events or conferences that they have the luxury of going to a few times a year, most of the time they are heads down looking at what's right in front of them in their own company. You across your firm have the privilege of serving a whole range of clients in that sector and beyond. What do you know? What do you pick up from the market that you could pull together into some fewer future-focused insights that the GC would say, wow, thanks for bringing that. That's the kind of conversation that people in these three practice groups need to open up and then figure out how to connect the dots back inside the firm so you can bring an additional practice group that the client will truly value. You know, kind of do the math here. If you're shifting this curve along, you end up with, you know, some more clients, not all of them, right? That's not strategic. It's unrealistic, but some more clients, one in 10 get shifted along this curve. Here's what we calculated, 70 million euros in upside potential from additional collaboration-based revenue. And what we know 
Um, Chilla and I and our whole team, we're talking to dozens of clients, your clients, every single month. And what they tell us repeatedly is they're surprised at how few of even their panel firms are having discussions with them about broadening that service. And they would welcome it, provided that you're tackling a, a, a problem or a challenge or an opportunity that's on the, the GC agenda. Now, one other critical area besides, you know, simply looking at the top line growth, and by the way, bottom line growth, growth you know, is even more charged when you are serving in a cross-practice way and broadening and deepening relationships with existing clients. But beyond thinking about the financials, the innovation implications of smarter collaboration are enormous. So we're providing data here. Data is... The backbone of what we do, we have empirical evidence and science backing up all of our uh, understanding of the benefits of smarter collaboration, as well as the how-tos. So here's some publicly available data. Um, it is the number of patents awarded in the U.S. from the mid-70s until quite recently. That big blue stripe at the bottom that's you know kind of trending down, that shows the proportion of patents that are awarded to solo inventors. And as you see, that proportion has shrunk by half in those decades. Whereas three-person patent teams have doubled proportionally and seven-person patent teams have become ninefold more important. So clearly it shows that innovation is a team sport. What the data doesn't show, this simply shows the number of inventors. Other kinds of data shows us that when you get in inventors or different kinds of thinkers coming together across disciplines from different backgrounds, from different life experiences, not only the likelihood of innovating increases, innovation happens faster and it's more likely to get adopted. It's better, faster, more implementable, if that's a word, innovation. All right, so let me just um, take a, a quick pause there. I see there's some chats coming in. Chilla, I, I trust you'll jump in and let me know if there's anything I need to be paying attention to. Absolutely. Okay, so we're, we were talking about innovation um, and financials, and it's easy to think about how those two go hand in hand. So much of what you need to do with clients and for clients requires novelty. But it's not just new ideas, it's new ideas that get applied. And when we're thinking about who needs to be in the mix, we also need to think about when they're brought in. So here's a, a quote. It's um, I can say it, it's, it's Roche, the, the pharmaceuticals company, more than 100-year-old Swiss pharmaceuticals company, very successful. Um, one of the case studies in our book, we looked at how they were applying smarter collaboration to their innovation process. And so the, this first part of the quote, we got the right people involved from the beginning, working together and accelerating everything. This is with regard to their drug development process. I want you to think about this from two angles, just before we go any further. Smarter collaboration requires you to get the right people involved and the timing matters. So if you are going to be thinking about litigation strategy, if you're going to be thinking about some of the IP ramifications, if you're going to be thinking about the business um, context that you're providing legal advice in, how do you make sure that your lawyers, you, you as partners, are getting enough well-rounded advice right from the beginning of the project? And this, by the way, is placing strategic bets. You're going to have to make a judgment call about when you lean on some people who have expertise outside of your domain right in the very beginning of the project because you are anticipating that their expertise might be valuable, or perhaps their expertise is valuable in shaping even how you go to market, how you think about pitching. Well, you cannot charge the client for that. And that's why I'm calling it a strategic bet. You've got to be thinking about, roll it forward. Think about what is it that you're trying to achieve ultimately? What is in the client's best interest? And then how do you dissect it so that you're making sure you have those different points of view right up front, right in the beginning? That's what Roche did. They got the right people involved from the beginning. They eliminated artificial boundaries. They stripped out bureaucracy. They removed the siloed approval processes. And look what happened. Their new process reduced the time to FDA approval 
by half. Now, you can think about this as another way that big pharma is making more money, or you can think about smarter collaboration leading to the kinds of outcomes where kids are getting life-saving drugs an entire year before they otherwise would. Like There are real tangible benefits for you and your clients engaging in smarter collaboration. It absolutely has business benefits, revenues and profits and client stickiness. But I want us to, to keep thinking about pulling back and understanding the whys of what we're doing. It makes a huge difference. And getting your partners to think about this, you and your fellow partners all engaging in what is it the bigger meaning of what we're doing. And by the way, you've got millennials and Gen Zs headed into the firm, if not ones that you're working with already. All of the research suggests that the younger generations care deeply about this idea of meaning and purpose. Smarter collaboration allows each person to play to their strengths, which is a tremendous source of engagement. And it allows you to help your clients do important, high impact outcomes for society. Step back. Heidi, Heidi, just chiming in here based on the comment by Patrick McKenna in the chat room. This is exactly the kind of client centric point of view that many of us want to bring more to the forefront, whether it's generational or not. Um, The kind of more traditional legal practice, internal focused uh, approach uh, needs to be upgraded. And the forward-looking, client-centric, uh, purpose-driven um, uh, client service is the one that that we are expected to deliver. Absolutely. And thank you, Patrick. That's exactly the kind of push that we need from people like you to make sure that we are keeping this front and center. It sounds soft and fluffy, but it's not. It is highly aspirational, and it should be a core part of your your client performance as well. I'm gonna go really quickly through this um, oldie but goodie. It is the twins. The twins are back for an encore performance. You know, for those of you who haven't seen it before, these are two nearly identical partners in a law firm and we map their collaboration patterns. Every dot here is a partner in the firm and the one that we're studying here, twin one, happens to both be men, He's worked with three other individuals in his department. You can see that because they're the same color dots as him. And the lines connecting him to all six other partners signify that he's worked with them on the same matter or deal, the same client file for a significant amount of time. But we have twin two, who, by the way, bills about the same number of hours a year. And he is wildly different in how he chooses to spend his time. One of the the, um, ahas to think about here, twin one has more or less a pattern like this big. Everyone is more or less the same distance from twin one. That signifies the distance between twin one's dot and other dots, how frequently they work together. Twin two, do you notice there's some people he works with all the time? They're super close to him. And then there are people who are way far away. Probably in this year that we captured the data, they only worked together once. It was for a significant amount of time on that one project, but just one project. It suggests here this pattern that twin two is highly strategic in how he activates his network. He, twin, twin one has his go-to people. He goes to them kind of all the time for everything. If he's collaborating, they're his go-to people. Twin two is hyper-selective and intentional about when he works with other people and how much. And at the end of the day, twin two is more than four times more productive across a whole basket of key performance indicators. Twin two is your model partner. Now, anyone who has questions about this, happy to entertain. Uh, We have uh, uh, designed entire sessions where we've spent hours just on this one concept and happy to think through with you, how do you become more like twin two? The point is not that you have a bigger network. Bigger isn't better. Better is better. Twin Two's network helps him be far more productive because it's more diverse. He's more strategic in how he uses it. And he's connected to other connectors. He's able with just one phone call to get to anyone else in the firm, probably who has the forward thinking, see around corners knowledge that his clients are demanding. I wanted to to reprise this um, idea of the twins 
because as long as we've been talking about it, we still don't have enough systems and structures built into law firms that encourage people to build, develop, and use the kind of networks like Twin2. We know who they are, but in many firms, you can actually name Twin2 you know, on a couple of hands. You know who's operating like this. My question to you is, what stands in the way and prevents far more people from engaging with each other like this? And now let's take it a step further. What would it look like if we mapped some of your best client service partners, not only their internal network, but their external one? How many of them have built relationships with outside experts, people who they could rely on, not on a daily basis, probably not even monthly, but from time to time when they want to put their heads together and say, hey, what are the ramifications of this new movement in the tech sector? Or how are we going to take this new kind of technology and bring it to bear in the retail space so that they're significantly more effective on their payments processing? I mean, those sound like pretty technical small things, but believe me, there are not only fintech companies out there who are built around developing these kinds of um, forward notions, but massive consulting firms who are building really sophisticated practices. I think it's worth um, mentioning right now that for the last, what, maybe two years, we've been talking about ESG. You know, So I've been talking to many, many of you and your firms about how boards, you know, the independent directors, the board chairs that we were interviewing for our most recent book had ESG top of mind. And we've been banging on about this um, for quite some time. You know, what is your point of view? Does every client facing lawyer in your firm understand how ESG is going to affect your, you know, the client's business? What's it mean differently in the healthcare sector versus the energy sector? People need to understand that. And for the, the lawyers who are out there going, yeah, my client isn't asking me about ESG, there's one of two answers. Either they're asking one of your competitors, probably not the position you want to be in when they're discussing things that matter to their board chairs, or they should be asking you. And that's an opportunity for you to have a more strategic conversation. Just 15 minutes before um, I logged on to this webinar, I was having a conversation with somebody in one of the big four firms. They were talking about a major U.S. bank. Every one of you knows the name of this bank. And guess what? Within the last six months, the general counsel has become the owner of ESG for this bank. The GC is now the entire you know, owner across the, the entire bank for everything ESG. And guess what? The general counsel turned to one of the big four firms because none of his panel law firms, probably some of your firms, were giving him what he needed around ESG, even when he was asking for it. So you can all sit there and think the big four don't matter to us. The big four in the US are not um, competitors to us. That might be true on the legal side, but what about on the strategy side? I bet this person is not the only GC in a major client of yours who owns the ESG agenda. And if your partners, if your firm isn't the go-to resource for ESG information, you have just lost a major opportunity to help that GC in something that he's feeling a bit um, uncomfortable and out on a limb with. All right, so think about it. This is a massive opportunity. Your twin twos need to be developing those resources so that they can talk comfortably and knowledgeably about ESG with clients. So if you're interested in promoting smarter collaboration, in fostering it, in implementing it, in embedding it, making it part of the day-to-day -day way people are operating, we've developed a toolkit for you. We uh, have been using this methodology for a good five years now. And what we did was we codified it. And um, our publisher, Harvard Business Review Press, is putting it out in the market. It's available to the public as a companion to our new book. 
it will be available on their their website um, uh, in January. I'm not sure exactly the launch date, but we can get you the information. This diagnostic toolkit is the very first step that you need to engage in, in figuring out where to solve problems that get in the way of smarter collaboration. Two things to say there. Number one, yes, we know what typical barriers are across law firms, across professional service firms. But what we also know is that your firm might not be unique in the strongest sense of the word, but it will have its own flavor based on your history, your growth patterns, the nature of the clients that you serve, the nature of the lawyers that you attract and retain. You will have different barriers that affect you. And what you cannot do is pick your favorite solution and then use that as a hammer going to find a nail. We have had such bad experiences with firms who have gone in and they picked something. It often, by the way, is compensation, right? That's the thing people complain about and they're specialized consultants. A lot of um, clients of ours will bring in um, somebody to rejig the compensation system, assuming that that's the root cause of the collaboration problems that they're experiencing. You cannot pick a solution before you've done the diagnostic to figure out, is that the biggest problem standing in your way? And indeed, is it absolutely the one you want to tackle first? So the toolkit here is, as I said, it's a companion to the book and it gives step-by-step instructions for unlocking better collaboration. So there's lots of different kinds of materials in this toolkit. It's like the step-by-step how-to guide to figure out where collaboration is working and what makes it work and how to replicate that and where there are barriers. Using a data-driven approach is crucial for the second piece I wanted to bring up to you. Oftentimes, leaders will say that they understand where the barriers are. They'll have a strong hypothesis. That's great to have a hypothesis, but you need to test the hypothesis with a robust methodology and in the least biased way. Notice I didn't say unbiased, but the least biased way you can. So collecting data and analyzing it um, with a methodology that we've um, developed over time helps you understand what's actually happening. Um, And so it gives you a much more objective understanding of this. It is, uh, yes, it costs a bit of money. It is a minimal sum of money and you have people probably in-house who are capable of using this toolkit. We made it as user-friendly as possible. And we're imploring you to think about being systematic and um, uh, empirical in figuring out what stands in the way of collaboration. That's the way you go about getting started. So these are some of the barriers that we see. You know, time pressure and efficiency often comes up as um, one one of the biggest barriers. Now, I suppose we can ask if the market takes a bit of a dip and people are not flat out, is that still going to be reported as the biggest barrier? Oftentimes when we see that as the barrier, what it means is one of two things and oftentimes both. One is that you don't have the right kinds of systems in place to make collaboration as seamless as possible. It's often hard for people to understand who has the most updated expertise in an area and figure out how to approach them most efficiently. It's also a question of what people believe is important. If, you know, this is where it links to uh, the compensation system and performance management system. If people are getting rewarded for individualistic outcomes, it's no wonder that those feel like a sideline that people can't find time for. So these are the kinds of barriers that often come up. What our um, experience is, is that in your firm, you need to figure out exactly the prevalence of these kinds of barriers and what do they really mean? Get underneath it and scratch the surface. That's what a, a, a more robust approach allows you to do. The second piece of the diagnostic, so we're I'm more or less um, thinking through as, as we um, developed this session for you, what's new in the smarter collaboration realm um, and, as opposed to what you may have learned about with smart collaboration. And one of the big developments that we've done since the publication of the first book was to create a psychometric tool That always sounds scary. Psychometric tools are not torture devices. They are simply instruments that measure somebody's psychological tendencies um, or behavioral approaches, which is what this one is, the Smarter Collaboration Accelerator. You had the chance 
um, if you clicked on that link, which we provided in the chat, to um, answer your own questions about risk. Risk is one of seven dimensions. Using all the data that we collected over you know, many years, we were able to bottom out seven different dimensions of collaboration behaviors that relate either, four of them relate to the way people approach collaboration. What kinds of problems are they drawn to? Complex or concrete? What's their risk propensity? Um, and the other three, there's you know a couple more than the other three relate to how people engage with one another in order to tackle the problems that they've identified and scoped, right? So think of that as kind of a, a heads and hearts, if you will. How do you think about collaboration and identify and scope those problems that warrant smarter collaboration? And the heart piece is how do you connect with other people in order to get that work done? So risk is one of the more cognitive sides. How do you think about risk? We see two kinds of uh, people generally you could be at one end of the spectrum or another. Risk seekers. For some people, it sounds like an oxymoron. Why would anybody ever seek risk? Well, risk seekers, they're not seeking unwarranted or calamitous risk. They're seeking risk in the sense that they don't want to leave any stone unturned they're motivated to capture every opportunity. They go to bed at night and say, yeah, okay, you know, a few things fell flat, stepped on a couple landmines, but hey, we didn't miss any opportunity, right? That's a risk seeker. A risk spotter at the far end of that, uh, the opposite end of that dimension will go to bed at night and say, phew, nothing blew up. They're motivated to avoid problems and failures and risks. Neither one of them is better or worse for smarter collaboration. But what we know is that those two kinds of people tend not to work all that well together. Risk seekers attract and are attracted to other risk seekers, the kind of people who are out there spotting opportunities all the time. And they really tend not to like to engage with the risk spotters because they feel like they're too negative. Risk spotters, on the other hand, which we're about to show you your own data, where do you come out? Risk spotters, yeah, many lawyers have a job risk spotting, but it may not be their natural tendency, but the risk spotters feel like the risk seekers are too reckless, right? So they tend not to work all that well with one another. So if you've taken the opportunity to do that quick survey yourself, answer this handful of questions, you will see where you come out. By the way, if you're in the middle, it doesn't mean you're indecisive or it, what it means is you're more context dependent. And if you are more context dependent, it means sometimes you are a risk seeker and sometimes you are more of a risk spotter. So let's see, where did you come out? Is um, We've got participants here. We've got risk spotter. 43% of you are risk spotters. Nearly as many are balanced. Ah, and not that many are risk seekers. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. So um, I'm getting, I'm seeing some questions popping up here. What would be the best result for a researcher? Um, Stefano, did you mean like, what was I hoping to see? Well, I was kind of hoping to see this or hoping to see any other profile here because what this tells you is what's your all else equal approach to looking at an issue. 43% of you are risk spotters. It means that any situation that arises, you are drawn almost instantaneously to focusing on what could go wrong. And you know what? Great. Your clients need you to figure out what will go wrong. They need you to anticipate that and help to put mitigation strategies in place and advise them on it. And that's perfect right up until the point where it's not, right? Because sometimes your clients need to, you know, if you have a general counsel client, they need to be answering to one of their business leaders who is really, really dead set on capturing massive growth opportunities. And you're going to need to get yourself out of your comfort zone and help to spot some of the upside potential or you're going to need to team up with the 19, one of the 19% of people on this call or in your firm who are automatically risk seekers. Their mind will be drawn to what really goes right here. 
Those of you, more than a third are in that balanced category. This means that sometimes you see the, the risk and the downside. Sometimes you see the opportunity. What I'd ask you to reflect on is what makes the difference? Is it genuinely that it's important to see the upside or is there some bias creeping in here? Are you more likely to evaluate a situation presented by one kind of person as riskier and not worth placing those bets than if it's presented by somebody else? Are you jumping to conclusions about whether this is an upside or a downside or are you taking a reasoned approach? And when I start to say the word bias, it triggers a whole lot of people. I'm not saying you are um, doing anything wrong, but what I'm asking you to be is as reflective as possible about where you're coming out. Does that make sense? So Chilla, anything to add in terms of um, what you observed here on the risk seeker, risk spotter? No, I, I'm I'm so excited to see any kind of makeup, really. As you said, there is no right or wrong answer, right? It just happened to be that this crowd is feeling very comfortable focusing on what could go wrong, right? Yeah. And what is interesting is when you're thinking about your client, how they are thinking about risk. Yeah. If they are actually coming to you to play the role of the risk spotter, then you need to know about that mm -hmm. and just fulfill that appetite because they might be coming to you because they are more on the risk seeker side. Yeah. However, the, the in-house legal team might be as likely needing a big push on the risk seeking side as well. So having that kind of conversation with the client, what is serving them the best will inform you, you know, what to really, you know, kind of put on the spotlight as yeah. they, you are interacting with them. A hundred percent. Absolutely. And I'm thinking back to the opportunity we had uh, last month in a setting where we had uh, more or less half uh, in-house legal team members, um, corporate lawyers, and half uh, people from inside law firms. And we did the same exercise there. And it was remarkable to see the split um, between in-house and, and law firms. So, you know, ask you to hypothesize, you know, kind of what do you think that looks like? Where do you think your clients are? Because um, uh, Chilla was absolutely right. you got to, to understand where your clients are and what they're asking you to do at any given time. Um, so if you're curious about this, we could, you know, maybe some other time we can have an, a, a session where we think through these different dimensions and how to spot um, what it is that your client is needing you to do. It also warrants a very um, deliberate, uh, intentional, specific conversation about this. But one of the things that we also want people, here's a, a list of all of the, the, the different um, uh, uh, dimensions, all seven of them here. One way to think about this as well is for any given group that you're working in, What's the collective profile? So this happens to be the um, uh, 12 senior executives from the M&A group of a huge global energy company. Um, and we're showing it to you because of um, their profile is super interesting. Um, this, you know, and so you might be, right, this could be your client, that you could be advising the M&A group in this global energy co. And you need to know if they look like this. So really quickly, we're not going to go through all of these. One thing you need to know is if you see that diamond shape, it means that a preponderance of these 12 people are on that side of the equation. So look halfway down the slide, you see the risk seeker dimension. Nearly everyone in this M&A group is a risk seeker, either a strong risk seeker or a moderate risk seeker. And if you are serving this M&A group, you know, your corporate lawyers, your, your deal lawyers better know that that's the case. Because on the one hand, they're going to have to be prepared to, if, if they have the profile that you did and 43% of them are on the risk spotter side, they're going to have to get way out of their comfort zone so that they can meet the client where they're at, looking at every possible upside opportunity. 
And they're also going to have to play the role of risk spotter to make sure they balance this out. So think about that. If you're a risk spotter, 43% of you are, how do you come across to the people who are the risk seekers? How do you voice your concerns? How do you raise the dangers? How do you wave, wave the red flag in ways that they actually want to listen to you? That's something you need to know. You have to be thinking about what's the profile of your client? How do you compliment them? And how do you meet them where they're at? So lots here to think about. Um, you know, this uh, uh, senior executive team, when we worked with them, they had a lot to think about because they were so homogenous. They were all similarly risk seekers and complex thinkers and so forth. So we had some important conversations about what does that mean? Where do they have blind spots? As well as what are their people processes? Like, why is it that only mini me's get to make it um, to the senior executive level uh, in this energy company? I mean, that's an important conversation to have, but I'd encourage you to be thinking about using a tool like this to examine the collective behaviors, blind spots, and superpowers, if you will, of some of the different groups that you've got inside your firm. That could be you know, the executive committee. It could be one of your sector groups. Um, where are you going to um, get out in front of where some of these tendencies are? If you have somebody in your firm who is um, equipped to be using tools like this, in other words, they use other kinds of psychometric tools, they have some kind of a psychology background, um, they're a coach, um, they're a learning and development professional, we've got a session next month to equip people to um, become accredited in delivering this kind of tool um, in-house. One thing I should also mention, we have a yet-to-be-scheduled Smarter Collaboration Masterclass at Harvard Law School, and everyone who comes to that program takes this um, uh, Smart Collaboration Accelerator, and we do have a session then to help you understand your collaboration strengths and when those tip over into weaknesses. Um, and for any firm that is sending a cohort, we can also provide this kind of analysis that says, as a group, how are you engaging with smarter collaboration? So feel free to reach out to us if um, you want more information on um, any of those opportunities for deepening professional development. One of the things as well for all of you to keep in mind is that when you're looking at your clients in their collaboration patterns, they've got an even more complicated job than you do when it comes to smarter collaboration. So we talk about it when we're working with corporate legal teams around four vectors of smarter collaboration. The first is that in-house, those legal teams need to work more effectively together. Sometimes there's a divide between the, the headquarters team, you know, quote unquote central, and legal teams that are embedded in different divisions or in different geographies. We actually wrote a case study about this. Um, ConocoPhillips was really facing some challenges trying to get their legal team to join up more effectively and avoid rework across different regions and make sure they were effectively engaging with each other so they could serve the business best. You can't take it for granted that just because people are in the same legal department nominally, that collaboration is happening as effectively as possible. My challenge to you is to make sure that when you're hearing some friction, some sort of sand in the gears that you're spotting in the legal team, that you're working effectively to raise those issues and solve them. You can play an incredible job as kind of insider outsiders if you are having a trusting relationship with any of your corporate legal teams to spot what's going on and to raise those kinds of issues. That's a very legitimate welcome role for outside counsel to play is figuring out where you can make that more effective. Of course, figuring out how to help the legal team collaborate more effectively with the quote unquote, the business, right? The board, the executives, the operators. We were astonished recently. We were working with the European GC of a huge global tech company. Like if I ask you to think global tech company, which one comes to mind? Yeah, it was probably that one, right? Um, so we're working with the European GC who was mentioning to us how valuable it was to have a secondee from one of their panel firms 
inside the, the, the corporate legal team so that that secondi would learn what were some of the pressures that the team was under when it came to collaborating with the business. One of those pressures was time pressure, unbelievably tight deadlines. Oftentimes, the, um, the GC explained that somebody in the legal team would get a call in the morning and expect to have a pretty well thought through answer by the afternoon. You know, we're talking like a seven, eight, maybe 10 hour turnaround time. By having somebody embedded in the legal team, that law firm understood how the, every minute was precious. And we're able to set up things like a, a SWAT team that was um, on call at any hour of the day or night. Let's not go into what ramifications that has for work-life balance, but go with me for a second. The SWAT team was available at any time of day in order to turn around and work with that um, corporate legal team so that they could provide almost instantaneous, well-thought-through service to the business. Right, so think of you know think about your clients, the the ones that are you're closest to, the ones that are most important to your firm. What would it take for you to do something innovative? It doesn't have to be big eye innovation. We're not necessarily talking about launching some new technology platform. We're talking about maybe doing something like figuring out a SWAT team so that you can always be there as the strategic partner for somebody in-house because they've got to collaborate with the board and the chief executives. They've also got to be collaborating with their fellow uh, functional executives. One thing I'd ask you to think about is, do you have any point of view that is valuable to somebody else who's the chief of a function? You know, is it the CFO? Is it the CHRO? You know, can you talk to somebody in legal with a, a perspective that would allow them to be smarter when they approach one of their functional counterparts? For example, you know, can you think through with them something like, what's the risk of voluntary and involuntary turnover given something that they have just adopted inside their company? Right? That might be something, you know, it's kind of a business problem. It's not a legal problem per se, but it could be the downstream effect of a, of, a, of a legal problem or solution they've put in place. Do you have that people perspective on it? Or do you have a strategic perspective or a financial perspective or a business intelligence perspective or a technology perspective? Somebody inside your law firm probably understands those second and third order effects what are you doing to team up and make sure you understand not just how to answer, answer the technically legal question, but taking it a step further and further so that you're equipping your general counsel or other in-house legal client so that they can face off with their functional counterpoint points and be well prepared for those discussions. You know, the other vectors of collaboration where you can help your clients are their interactions with the broader legal ecosystem. So yes, you know, you need to be collaborating amongst your partners and other people inside the firm so that you can um, interface better, engage in smarter collaboration with the in-house legal team. But can you do things like use your convening power to bring together um, some of your clients with, say, you know, other kinds of outside experts. This could be people who have a strong point of view on ESG, like we were talking about a few minutes ago. It could be on somebody who's, you know, just come out of the regulatory world um, and has, uh, you know, some forward-looking um, insights as to what that uh, the, those GCs should be aware of. I'd ask you to really think hard about whether you're doing enough to help connect your in-house clients with one another and with other people in the legal ecosystem. This does not mean, you know, running annual massive conferences. This means pulling four people together over bagels. It's not a huge investment of their time or your money or your time, but the returns are absolutely enormous if you carefully curate both who's in the room and what the agenda is for them to talk about together. I, I think this works absolute magic, and I cannot believe how few law firms are actually using that. You know, we're also working to help general counsel get that seat at the strategy table. Remember earlier, I was prompting you to think about how do you get the right people, not just in the room, but in the room early enough. And the general counsel are struggling with this a lot. 
I mean, how many times have you heard one of your clients say, ah, I can't believe I was asked to sign off on this. If they had only asked my opinion a month ago, we wouldn't be in this position. Yeah, it's happening way too often that the legal team is the afterthought or the the last step in the value chain um, asked to sign off as opposed to getting involved. So we've just um, put together a white paper telling general counsel how to get and use their seat at the corporate strategy table. And what you should know is prompting them to think about how they rely on external lawyers in order to make that happen. So, you know, things that you can do to help them. Um, thinking about the contextual knowledge, right? That's the sort of thing we mentioned earlier. You see lots of other companies that work in that industry. How are you harnessing that, pulling it together into a few insights and equipping the GCs with it because they need to know where their industry is headed. Not Again, not just from a legal side, but from a commercial side. Are you helping them to see threats and opportunities? 43% of you are risk spotters. You're probably more focused on the first half of that. Um, are you figuring out threats and opportunities? You cannot just be always on the negative side or the downside risk. And are you future focused in terms of what solutions you're delivering? That's absolutely essential that you're helping them see into the future. And you can help them make the most once they are respected and valued and included in those strategic decisions. You know, how do you help them project authentic gravitas? How do you get, help them gain deeper trust? And, you know, importantly, when is it that they're coming to you for those kinds of inputs? Let me just actually stop, take a breath for the first time in 20 minutes. Chilla, anything that we should pay attention to in the chat? Yes, ju just if you can voice over how to get a copy of the white paper, because oh. people are interested. Yep, yep, yep. Sorry, I totally glossed over that. Um, okay, people, your mind reading skills have to improve here. Nope, sorry, that's my fault. Um, small text at the bottom for a copy, email christine at gardnerandco.co. Christine is our... Um, Client and Communications Manager at Gardner & Co. Um, we, this was a, a joint effort um, across our team putting together this uh, GC white paper, and we'd be delighted to, to send it to you and strike up the conversation with you. Anything else, Chilla, before we move on? Yes, and, uh, there are comments that obviously the legal re regulatory teams are really spread too thin um, because of the multi-teaming uh, yeah. for all different kind of internal projects. Uh, that's the reality. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, with without a doubt, um, when we do the diagnostic inside corporate legal departments, uh, it is very, very, very common that lack of time or time pressure is what gets in the way of uh, of them engaging in better collaboration. You could play a vital role in that. Um, first of all, just by acknowledging it, as we all know, um, client relationships are built on, guess what, relationships. You have to demonstrate that you've got their back, that you know what they're up against. And um, a phrase uh, I was uh, listening of the last day to somebody who is an incredibly experienced client service um, partner and leader. And, um, and, and he has been working in the professional services space for decades. He said his best relationship building tip is to go to a client and say, I know you are extremely exhausted, under a lot of pressure, and really busy. What can I take off your plate? Huh. All right, so that's like the one question he uses to spark a conversation and signal to clients that he understands what they're up against. Um, and demonstrating how you can help the general counsel or whoever your client is, you know, in that regulatory team and the compliance team, et cetera, um, save time is absolutely essential. I'm going to make a plug for one small tactic, just on the very practical, pragmatic side here. One tactic that I'd implore you to think about is asking your client how they want to receive information. It sounds so obvious, but do you have that conversation repeatedly? I mean, is it actually that they want the, the email response? Do they want a slide deck? 
right? Oftentimes, you know, for better or for worse, as communications experts will tell you, people inside corporates are still communicating with each other via PowerPoint. Don't send your client a long legal memo without also giving them the slide with three bullet points on. And I don't mean bullet points that basically have squeezed your entire legal memo in two point font onto a slide. I'm talking about a slide with no more than 50 words on it. Like slides shouldn't have more than about 50 words. Now, of course, everyone's probably here counting how many words I have on my slide. But um, but think about the skill that it takes to synthesize the so what's in a long legal response into some bullet points. That is truly a learned skill. You might not have time for it if you're a partner. You might think your clients don't want you to spend time and they don't want to pay you for taking time to do that. Guess what? They're probably right. Who should do that? I think it's the perfect job for an associate or a senior associate. If your associates are so good that they can not only help to formulate the legal response in its full-on pros and legalese, but if they can take that and turn it into a single slide with three bullet points, you can be assured that they actually understand what's in that memo and what matters to the client. That is an incredibly valuable coaching experience. I dare say there's a lot of partners out there who themselves would be challenged to do that, let alone coach associates to do it. But that's why we need to start early. So save your um, GC's time. Um, if they have to communicate your responses in some format, make sure you're providing that format to them. Right? Um, I want to talk for a minute about third parties here. This is a new area that we've explored in the Smarter Collaboration book because it has absolutely exploded in the last six years. If your firm, if you feel like this is not as relevant to your firm, if you, you are not teaming up with a whole bunch of third parties in the supply chain, in the technology space, et cetera, it means just that you're behind, you know, it's, it, you're behind um, standard. Um, the, the world is moving in ways, and we're not just talking about gig economy and porous boundaries between who's an employee and who isn't and so forth. Um, what we're talking about here is making incredibly reasoned, sophisticated, nuanced decisions about when you're partnering with third parties on everything like uh, from technology development to outsourcing back office sorts of functions to a whole range of other opportunities where you might legitimately say, that's not the business of our firm, right? And engage in smarter collaboration. Find out, is there another party out there, some other kind of company or organization that takes non-core work off your plate and does it, frankly, better, cheaper, and faster than you do. And the better part is the most important part, obviously. So when you're thinking- Heidi, about, Heidi yeah, before, before we get into the details about uh, collaboration with third parties, Fahim had a really interesting point, and it's relevant for the third parties, but also internal collaboration is about trust. Uh, yeah. Collaboration is all about trust and being open. And what Fahim is pushing, you know, that's that's quite fragile. And if it's not used properly, it can actually backfire and mm -hmm. create just just unfair play. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, huge, Fahim. I mean, you couldn't be um, more spot on there. Trust is absolutely the foundation and it's competence trust. It's how much does somebody believe in my capabilities? Do they believe I deliver high quality on time, on budget, and that I serve the client in ways that meet their client service standards? But it's also the interpersonal trust, the jerk factor. If you work with me, am I going to steal your ideas? Am I going to claim them as my own? Am I going to do something to um, push you aside and try and take over that relationship? It's astonishing to me that we're still having that conversation inside partnerships where people are worried about their their, you know, their peers undermining them, but it happens more frequently than it should. And so trust is foundational. And um, I'm going to wrap up with this slide. I know we're at the top of the hour um, and I thank everyone for joining us, but just a couple of how to's when you're thinking about collaborating across parties, because if you can't even get trust to flourish within your partnership, how are you thinking about developing real deep trust so that you can share sensitive data and rely on third parties for critical aspects of your client service. 
One, I would say, is make sure you're incredibly selective about where you're engaging third parties. Um, Is it truly going to add value to bring in somebody who's a real specialist in this area? The other thing is to manage your own culture. This is exactly where trust comes in. I mean, people need to trust one another sufficiently before you can bring in a third party and ask them to to, um, generate multidimensional trust as well. Finding senior um, senior leader champions is crucial. If you're going to be bringing in a third party to provide a, a technology platform that forms the basis of how you engage with clients, for example, um, you need to make sure that the tone from the top is absolutely crystal clear that this is the way we're going to engage with clients. Um, people have to be fully on board with this and true champions of this kind of change. And then lastly, once you've been down this road for a while, um, asking you to keep these relationships with third parties completely refreshed. Um, periodically plan these kinds of reviews. And if you need to retreat, some of, not every one of these third party relationships is going to work out and you have to be prepared to pull the plug on it sooner rather than later. Or if you find that um, through the course of a longer term relationship, things have kind of just gone a bit flat, you need to reinvigorate this and relaunch it. Maybe get some fresh perspectives in here and figure out how to re-engage in that conversation um, about what your shared objectives are and how you're going to make sure that you are accomplishing more together than any of you could do on your own. I mean, that is the nature of smarter collaboration. And whether you're working internally to serve clients or whether you're teaming up with third parties in order to make that service more differentiated or faster or cheaper or better, you have to engage in this kind of smarter collaboration and trust underpins it all. So thank you for joining us. Wow, this hour went incredibly fast, at least for me. Um, And uh, I I would welcome the opportunity to continue the discussion. As I mentioned, we are going to um, uh, schedule a Smarter Collaboration Masterclass at Harvard Law School. It's a multi-day residential on-campus program where we'll have the chance to work through these kinds of issues and opportunities in real time. Um, And by all means, reach out to the Harvard Law School Executive Education or to me directly to find out more information about that. I'll stick around for a few minutes. I'm going to open up uh, open up the chat if there is any um, specific um, question or response that you need at this point, feel free to chat it in. Otherwise, um, thanking all of you for your attention and for anyone who's joining by video, thanks for joining as well.